Hello viewers at home, uh, my name is Akinwale Ojomo and we, I welcome you to this special edition of uh, Global Culture, which is actually, uh, we have a sub here called Casual Politics, whereby we talk about the political happenings around the world. Uh, today we have a special thing happening in West Africa, Nigeria. The president, uh, President uh, Jonathan Gullock, recently removed the oil subsidy, meaning that uh, the prices of oil, the oil-related materials will go up. So today we bring in guests right here who will be talking about this. I have on my left hand side is somebody you must have known actually is an attorney who lives in Washington DC area, Emeka Nwoye. Welcome to the program. Thank you. All right. And on my, on my right hand side right here, I have a gentleman, he's a community leader. Uh, actually, he came to the United States about uh, a couple of years ago. And of course, we have a blend of him still fresh from Nigeria. And you know, of course, uh, his name is Bayo Arowolaju. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to go quickly to the business of today because around the world, uh, people have been reacting, Nigerians have been reacting, and friends of Nigerians have been reacting as well. Understanding what is a subsidy. Uh, can I start with you? What to our viewers at home who say, what is an oil subsidy? Uh, subsidy implies that the true cost of a uh, petrol product was reduced by a contribution by the government making it possible for individuals to purchase uh, petrol at prices below their market value in a competitive market setting. Okay. Very smart, uh, smart lawyer. He's been to give that to you. You know, and from, from your uh, experience as well, what do you think is a subsidy relating to the uh, gasoline in Nigeria? Uh, just like uh, the lawyer said, uh, it was, you know, right on what subsidy is. Uh, you know, subsidy is, you know, what the government subsidize uh, you know, the amount of money that, you know, petroleum product is being sold to the people. So the government is paying the difference, you know, between uh, the, the actual price and the price that the market has imports, you know, the, the, the gasoline or the fuel into the country. Thank you very much. And at this time, we're going to go into the uh, details. Now, uh, I'm going to start with you, Emeka, uh, because you've been following the trends right now. Can you give us a, a quick snapshot of the historical perspective? January 1st, 2012, the president of Nigeria... President Jonathan Gullock said the Nigerian government is removing the oil subsidy. Tell us what has happened since that time. Over the years, the um, Nigerian government had subsidized the price of petroleum, making it possible for Nigerians to purchase petroleum at prices lower than what would have otherwise obtained. Okay. And uh, almost also over the years, there had been a pressure on the part of the government to take away this subsidy, thereby increasing the prices of petrol. And Nigerians have consistently resisted this. The turning point, however, became this year when Nigerian government decided that the subsidy regime has reached a point where it has become absolutely unsustainable. That is just a summary of it. There's a lot more to the subsidy argument. Okay. Again, Nigerians resisted it. And now the president, in a dramatic fashion, uh, removed the subsidy right in the middle of a raging discussion over the subject. And as was expected, and as was threatened by the Labour Congress in Nigeria, right. they mobilized the people, and the resistance has just begun. Okay, thank you. It just began. And uh, actually, Bayo, can you tell us uh, January 1st, things have started happening since that time. January 9th, uh, the National Labour Congress, which is the labor union, uh, mobilized and told their workers to stay at home. And things have started happening since that time. That is January 9th, and today is January the 12th. So can you tell us what has really happened in terms of uh, the details of uh, strike? Uh, on uh, the 1st of January 2012, uh, the President and the Commander-in-Chief of Armed Forces in Nigeria, in person of Good Luck Ebele, Jonathan, uh, took the oil subsidy off. Uh, I've been following events in Nigeria, and I knew when the president presented the budget for 2012 to the Congress, and there was no provision for oil subsidy, I knew oil subsidy was going to go. Okay. So just to put it in, you know, in a nutshell, the subsidy was actually removed when the government presented the budget, and there was no provision for oil subsidy. So when the people had the announcement on January 1st, which some people said, oh, this was the Christmas or New Year gift that the president gave to all of us, okay. is to jump uh, the selling of uh, you know, petroleum products, especially petrol that people use a lot, from 65 to 140 uh, you know, naira per liter. So 
the Labour Congress, they already said it before, Obasanjo tried it. They told the government that if subsidy is removed, they will mobilize in masses against the removal of voice subsidy. And owning up to their threat, the Labour Congress, they've you know, brought out their members in hundreds of thousands on the street of Lagos and big cities in Nigeria. And that's what we are currently saying. Okay, from the uh, perspective of, of the diaspora, that's what we are doing that today. You know, we are in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, things are happening uh, in New York. Uh, on, mon on Monday, so to speak, in Washington, D.C., near the World Bank, uh, the Nigerian groups actually were there to protest this. And on Tuesday in New York, uh, a group as well went to the street to really show this... Um, uh, the, 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 the way they feel about this. Also in Chicago, there's going to be different meetings coming up as well. So Emeka, tell me, now, with government looking at this, are you saying that the government is just looking the other way? Um, it is clear that um, the reactions of Nigerians all over the world to the oil subsidy removal controversy has been extremely astounding. Mm -hmm. Nobody, nothing else, has united Nigerians across the world in recent times right. more than this. Right. We, we are witnessing protests all over the world. Europe, occupying Nigeria is occurring in London, New York, Washington, and something is coming up in Chicago right. fairly soon. I think um, um, the, the government must have been taken by surprise. I cannot believe that they foresaw the reaction of the people and deliberately put themselves and the country in this crisis situation. So it's some sort of inspiration for Nigerians in Nigeria to know that Nigerians outside Nigeria are supporting them in full measure. And um, I believe that sends a strong message to the Nigerian government, who might have easily ignored the local forces, now realizing that the Nigerians are united on this single important issue, I'm hoping that the government is going to do what is reasonable in this circumstance, which is to reverse the subsidy uh, removal policy with immediate effect and then sit down and plan out the best way to come around addressing the fundamental question of the fact that subsidy on fuel cannot be sustained. It's a question of planning, it's a question of organization, it's also a question of communication. Okay. And that's what I think is lacking at the moment. I okay. hope the government gets around <laughs> And that's why we are doing that on this show, okay, as global culture, casual politics, is to, like, you know, create this panel so that we'll be able to talk about this. You know, I was, when I was doing the research for this program, I listened to a couple of debates done in Nigeria. As a matter of fact, uh, the, you know, current uh, Minister of Health, uh, Minister of Finance, and the, you know the Minister of Petroleum and a huge number of you know the stakeholders. And one thing I really observe is that they spend four hours to talk about that. And listening to that, I realized that they spend thirty minutes to recognize individuals in the place. Unfortunately, looking at the panel, there's nobody under forty sitting in the panel. And I'm listening right here. I'm saying, how can the past and the present talk about the future when the future are not on the table. So, Bio, you are the future. What do you think? Uh, that, has, well, that has been one of the things that I've, you know, that I've been disappointed about, you know, about Nigeria for a very long time. There is no, what I call, generational trend in dealing with issues that have to do with the politics and the policy of the Nigerian government. We have seen in Nigeria what, what I call rotational force behind people in power. In Nigeria today, people that have been in power for many years, since the 80s, since the you know, 60s, since the 70s, they are still the ones ruling us. People cannot find jobs. People graduate from schools. They cannot find employment. There's no employment for people. People you know, graduate, they give one year of youth service to the country. They can still find job. Like you said, when we don't have young people the youth of the country on the table in a national debate such as the removal of subsidy is very painful. Right. It's very heartbreaking. And if I may react to this as well, the discussions you referred to, organized by the Minister of Finance, Central Bank Governor, and the Minister of Petroleum, actually turned out to be inadequate. If you look at the fundamental issues at stake, it had to do with the credibility of the government. Nigerians simply don't trust Nigerian government. And in fact, the more the ministers spoke on these issues, the more they confirmed the fear of Nigerian peoples. How can you explain the corruption, the build-up of corrupt practices over the fuel subsidy regime? And interestingly, the ministers now turn around and said, well, there's so much corruption on this, and we have to give it up. 
But how come that over the years there hasn't been any prosecution of anybody who practiced corruption? So how could the government invariably say, hey, we were overwhelmed by the level of corruption. We don't know what to do except to take away the subsidy. Actually, that confirms the position of the opposition. They turn around and say, of course, this is what we told you. If you can't address corruption at this point, how do we know? that you can address corruption in the future with so, respect to the alternatives. So what that means is that even, let's assume now, the subsidy is removed and the fund is right there. How will you be able to use it? I'm going to refer to the debate I mentioned uh, in Nigeria. Uh, actually, the, the, of course, the uh, Minister of Finance spoke eloquently to take us through the, what is uh, subsidy, uh, the real implications and the savings and how the savings will be used. And the point you are making, America, right here is that how can Nigerians trust their leaders if in the past they have not been able to trust them? Just to let you know, viewers at home, we are bringing this forum to let you see the pros and cons of subsidy. At the same time, look at the causes and how we can move this debate forward. We are doing this in the, in the, uh, the, the Nigerian diaspora as our own contribution to the way things will be rolling out in the next couple of years. So tell me. What's your guess in the next couple of weeks? What do you think the government, the president is thinking? If he's watching this program, what do you think he's going to get from this program? I, I think the, the, the president of Nigeria had what I call bad planning in taking away first subsidy. I'm going to say uh, very emphatically, I know people may be surprised, you know, that I live in the diaspora and I want to say this. But I would say that I'm in support of the removal of first subsidy. Okay. But based on what I have studied, on what I have learned about first subsidy, the Nigerian system or the Nigerian government cannot sustain how much they subsidize, subsidizing on fuel. Okay. And we have a particular sector of the economy that is benefiting from oil subsidy. But when you have a situation that is very volatile as the removal of oil subsidy, the number one citizen in the country should use good judgment. He's an educated individual. He's not an illiterate. He was elected by above 50 percent of the vote, whether or not it was rigged. He's the current president. When they bring situation of oil subsidy to your table by the Minister of Finance, by the CBN governor, you need to make your judgment based on the people that elected you. Those ones, they may come, they may come on the table with their numbers. Right, the right. numbers does not rule the people. This is not dictatorship. This is a democratically elected government in Nigeria, and you need Need to put first the people that elected you. Okay. I'm very concerned because the Nigerian that I know, or the Nigerian system of governance that I know, more money does not equal to more infrastructure or more development. There you go. So the point that uh, the Minister of Finance was making is when you have these savings, it will be used for roads, for rail, and the different infrastructure that Nigeria is missing at the moment. Emeka, tell me, from your own standpoint, uh, people now, is good now. We have on this side, you support it. On this side, you oppose it. From the standpoint of the timing, what do you think about the timing of this? But that is the big elephant in the room. From the macroeconomic point of view, we can basically say that the oil subsidy is unsustainable. Right. But you must know that every government in the world subsidizes something for its citizens. Right, absolutely. The United States subsidizes agriculture. European Union subsidizes health care. So even the Minister of Finance is not saying no to subsidy in the future. She just basically says, we're going to take it away from oil and put it in medical care. So ultimately, somebody's going to be subsidizing something for the country. However, her argument for ending subsidy on fuel is because she says there's so much corruption in that system. How do we know that there wouldn't be corruption in the healthcare industry as well? So the corruption argument is an overarching argument, which is going to affect every aspect, every policy, every measure the government takes. And that's why we turn around and said, hey, anywhere in the world, if the prices of essential commodities were to jump by more than 100%, mm -hmm. it's going to bring down any democracy in the world. In the United States, if the price of gas, gasoline, were to go up by 25% suddenly tomorrow morning, Obama's regime is in trouble. Right. So how come that Nigerian government should be so insensitive as to the political and social implications of this extraordinarily controversial policy? Pull off subsidy suddenly in the middle of discussions, and then only after that begin to consider various palliatives. There is no doubt in my mind that the oil subsidy removal on, on December, on January 1st was based on poor planning 
and failure to fully articulate the implications for Nigerian people. And the labor is right. There is so much insensitivity on the part of the government. How would the poor people who have lived on $2 a day cope with an increase on fuel to a point far in excess of 200%. That is bizarre. Right. It's not a democracy. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Emeka. And uh, I, will, I, will, I will take it a little bit further and tell our viewers at home, especially if you are you know, watching us in the uh, United States or even around the world, we are telling you that this debate is to give the different perspective of what oil subsidy is, the impact, the social, political impact of this. It's very, 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 very important. So, Bayo, tell me, like I mentioned before, if uh, the ministers, the advisors are saying this is what is on the table. How will the president, how will the current regime get out of this? And how, of course, the labor union is still saying this is going to be our own stand. The people needs to win. Again, I'm going to go back to the number one citizen of the country, which happens to be the president of Nigeria in person of Ebele Goodluck Jonathan. I'm going to give you an example. Versions of how to kill Osama bin Laden was presented to the president of the United States, President Obama. Obama took the best option, which he felt was going to be the best option to get rid of Osama bin Laden. That, wasn't, that doesn't mean that many versions were not presented to him. Okay. They presented those versions, and he picked the version that he, that he was comfortable with because he knew that if anything went wrong or goes wrong, rather, he's going to be to take the responsibility. The president was given these options. The president has the responsibility to the Nigerian people to make the right decision. So what you're saying is that the government, uh, the government have on the table different options. They had on the table different okay. options, and the president went for removal of the first subsidy, which I think was a wrong judgment in a right direction. Okay. Removal of first subsidy is in the right direction, but the implementation of how the subsidy should be removed was wrong. This is a president who is now buying 1,600 mass transit for Nigerians after you have removed the subsidy. Why didn't you do that about six months ago? When people were haggling about minimum wage and they were saying, oh, minimum wage is going to be 1,800 and people were fighting over, over 18,000 naira of minimum wage, why didn't you implement the payment of minimum wage in those states and in, at the federal level right away? You already had in mind that oil subsidy was going to be removed. So These palliative measures okay. that the president is now putting in place should have been done before January 1st of 2012. And just to mention about labor in Nigeria, okay. we don't have labor in Nigeria. And I say that because the labor force, the labor congress in Nigeria, they are also corrupt. This is the same labor congress or the same labor in Nigeria right. that they have witnessed this corruption in the Nigerian government for a very long time. First subsidy was put in place by Shagari. Okay. Up to today, we have subsidy, we have corruption. Why haven't labor come out? Why haven't they ever been on the street? Because they know that the canker worm that is hitting Nigerian system and hitting Nigerian economy is corruption. Why have they, where have they been? Wow. Okay, Emeka, tell us now. Now that he says, oh, palliative measures, we have a lot of buses on the road overnight. I mean, I'm not sure if they were manufactured in Nigeria or both from abroad. But the most important thing is that he has put the cart before the horse. What do you say? Definitely. <laughs> the government's planning is poor. Its execution is absolutely abysmal. So what do, what do they do from here? What do they do from here? Uh, there's no doubt that the president of Nigeria is in a quagmire. Okay. He has to try to find a way quickly, I hope, quickly. to wriggle out of this growing and expanding complexity. Right. Because the Nigerian people ultimately found their voice. They came together in unison, in increasing numbers. Looking at the last statistics, it seems that there were 3 million people in the streets of Lagos just yesterday. Right. So, and if that number continues to increase, ultimately, this administration is endangered. Okay, uh, I'm going to jump in real quickly. We talk about the Arab Spring, and uh, viewers at home, uh, everybody's aware about the Arab Spring. I was jokingly saying, it's going to be an African summer. What do you say, Bayo? I say that it's not going to be any African summer. Nigeria people, they will not go for any revolution. I've spoken about this with friends, with family. Everybody is saying that we're going to have another, you know, Libya. We're going to, it's not going to happen in Nigeria. Why do you say that? People understand the system of governance. Mm -hmm. President Jonathan is going to cave in on this. Okay. Because he knows that if he doesn't cave in on this, he has a big mess in his hands. The house is going to cave in. This is going to be tomorrow. It's going to be a week of this. People staying at home. It is my understanding that the Senate and Labor 
there's mediation going on between Senate and Labour, and uh, Pius Aimu, which happened to be the Secretary to the State Government, and the Labour Minister, they've been meeting with Labour. It has happened before in Nigeria in 2003, like I said earlier at the program, in the beginning of the program, Obasanjo tried it. Right. Yadua tried it. People will come out on the street, they will have palliative measures, they will tell us that, oh, we will say, we will take it to 65, we will take it to 75, right. but in the long run, you can be rest assured, God willing, there is not going to be any revolution in Nigeria. I don't know if Emeka disagrees with me. Uh, well, I think the times are much different from right. the examples you've given. We've never had a situation where there is so much mobilization of Nigerians across the world. We have never seen the people come out with this level of participation that is being witnessed around the world. I think that we crossed the point. It was said last year by the president of Nigeria that what happened in the Arab world would never happen in Nigeria, mm -hmm. which seems to be actually incorrect. Right. Revolutions are never planned. Revolutions are never predictable. Things get out of hand. I think that what occurred in December of 2011 was unprecedented by a combination of series of factors, including particularly the apparent uh, apparently unresolvable problem in the, of security in the northern part of Nigeria. Right. Boko Haram has become extremely uh, uncontrollable, and I wouldn't know why on earth the president of Nigeria should allow this crisis on fuel subsidy to grow at this time when he's caught up in this extraordinary quagmire in the northern part of Nigeria. I think that this government is essentially has crossed a point where even if he remains in office, it's going to be a lame duck, it's going to spend the rest of his time explaining this blunder. I wish, I wish, I wish we had the old time and it's getting so excited every minute. Uh, I guess one thing you mentioned, which I'm going to reiterate, is the power of the social media. And that cannot really be, I mean, a, a plus for that this time because information was sent around the world. Like you mentioned, this is the first time we're going to have a global mobilization on an issue by Nigerians around the world. Viewers at home, we've come to an end of another session. I thank the gentleman right here, Bayo. Thank you so much for coming to this program. You are coming to us, man. And Emeka, it's always good to have you as well. Thank you. I thank hope we're going to do this more, especially as things are rolling out in the next couple of uh, days. I look forward to it. All right, so viewers at home, thank you again for the casual politics, a sub of Global Culture TV. Uh, we thank you again for watching us. Uh, like we said, Global culture, we're going to be bringing you things around the world, what is going on. And today, we talk about the removal of the oil subsidy by President Goodluck Jonathan of Nigeria. I send off right now. I will see you next time. Thank you.